Here is one of the most important things that you would have on the frontier. Anybody want to take a guess? Look at my yeah. cosmetic thing, mm -hmm. right? You want to look nice for the... Pardon me? Ah, uh, closely related. It's not fire. tobacco, huh? Fire yes, fire starting kit. Excellent. Let's give her a hand. Very good. Very good. This is your fire starting kit. So, yeah, and it's really neat to think that, you know, the 1840s brought us a lot of new technology like telegraph and uh, photography. Uh, and somebody thought, why don't we put something, uh, a sulfuric compound on a stick and make friction a match? Nobody had thought of matches yet. So this was the technology up until the invention of the match. And you want to keep it all together in this tin. The only thing that's missing, this is a new one, is a hole. I need to put a hole on top of this and put on wax on top. And I'll tell you why in a second. What do you get when you look under tin number one? Ah, you see some stuff. You see a second tin. Hmm. Can I trade you this tin, Lucy, for this tin? Or would you like $10? Uh, no. All right, so there's a second tin. We'll leave that to the side here. And we got some other stuff. We got little nests of um, twine and rope. We have a piece of flint and a piece of steel. So here is your flint and here is your steel. Now, as we all know, or should know, flint, which is, uh, I have a spare piece if you want to pass around what flint looks like. Flint is not native to our area right here. Um, it's a metamorphosized chert, as far as I understand. Uh, chert is another rock that will make um, you know, sparks as well. But uh, flint is, here's a piece of flint you can pass around. Um, and, uh, but Ohio has Devonian rocks uh, exposed at the surface because of the ice age. So Ohio was a great source of flint. And flint was traded, of course, with the Indians. They would make their arrow points, but also scrapers. And uh, the Euro culture would use it for their what? flintlock rifles. So we needed flint too, and for your fire starters. So if you know when flint and steel, okay, you saw the spark, right? That's actually the steel that's burning, not the flint. So little pieces of hot steel are flying off of this flint. Now, we all know that um, where there's spark, there's a flame, but how do you catch the flame? Uh, you know, it's like rubbing two sticks. Go ahead, rub two sticks together. <laughs> Show me Show me a fire, right? I'll come back in six hours when your arms are falling off. The problem is to catch that spark and transfer it to something flammable. And for that is what was lost, uh, you know, culturally for a long, long time. That's what resides in here. And it's so important. It has its own waterproof container to carry it in. I've had, Ed, we actually had a student in uh, Glasgow, Missouri that knew the answer. The first kid in tens of thousands of school students that we've had over the years doing living history with Lewis and Clark knew the right answer. Anybody want to take a guess? What is in this tin? Cedar bark. To catch, that's a good, that, that is one of the, there's a fungus you can use, uh, some barks can be used, but the most used was char cloth. Is that a new word for most folks? Yeah, okay, yeah. char, let's all say that. Char cloth, very good, uh, very good, back in school. Uh, and char cloth, same idea as charcoal, or as Henry Clay Frick made his fortune, uh, coke from coal. If you burn coal, which is all around here, without oxygen, you will burn out the impurities and you'll be left with almost pure carbon. And in that case, it's called coal, it, uh, it coke, coke from coal. If you make charcoal from wood, same idea. In the Lewis and Clark expedition, Ed might know exactly where they stopped, but they stopped up to a couple days to make charcoal for John Shields, who was the blacksmith. They actually had a blacksmithing forge with them and would ping out things along the expedition. But they had to make charcoal, and they would get all the wood they wanted to turn into charcoal, cover it with mud so it wouldn't burn, and then have a fire around that and bake Bake the wood. Same thing as the same idea. Uh, in here, and this is what char cloth, I can't really pass it around. It is extremely, well, we say it's Italian. It's fragile. Uh, fragile. It's extremely um, delicate. Ooh. And what char cloth is, basically, you just take an old shirt. You can take old canvas. You can take uh, any kind of cloth uh, uh, of that nature that's uh, made of cotton base and you go back to your fire starting kit, and this is where the hole comes in. You take little squares, 
uh, you have your fire, you know, another fire that's already going, take out some coals from that fire and set it down on top of those coals and don't allow the textile to burn. And in a few moments, there'll be a funky little blue smoke that'll come out and the result will be fried uh, textile. And that's char cloth. And that's how they would make the char cloth. And they would put it in this uh, container here because you did not want to get it wet. And they really will disintegrate just about in your hands. Um, somebody asked, where do we get our clothes? It's a great question. Um, there are companies that make, now if you can make your own, that's fantastic. I'd love to say I can make all this stuff. But uh, myself, you know, I make like my glass container, something very important to me, uh, <laughs> moccasins, uh, a medicine bag. But there are companies, and uh, Ed and I, he knows several that he's worked with, Panther Primitives. I work mostly with a company in Indiana called Townsend and Sons. They make all this stuff. I, I bought this fire starting kit from them. Uh, they make things for, you know, not just the clothes themselves, but all the articles and things you need for your campfire and, uh, you know, your canteens and all kinds of stuff. And it's for, for civilians, it's for kids. Uh, it's, um, they really have a lot of neat stuff for people of all ages. So it's a really neat hobby. So at this point, it is a matter of technique. And what you want to do is you want to have, um, I'm still experimenting with the right kind of just the most perfect nest you can get. Um, you can use various substances for this intermediate spot here. Um, some, you can use a bird nest. You can use lint from your, uh, from your clothes dryer. Uh, I get it from my belly button, but no. Um, but I like old rope because it is so accessible. It's around everywhere. The best is rope that's kind of been on a boat for a while and, uh, you know, is kind of um, dried out, maybe has a little oil in it. So I got some fairly dry rope, but you just untwine it and you make like a nest like that. Now I'm working on an even better technique because we had problems, remember, at that last festival. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to work in the engineering, frontier engineering to make it better. Now I've got twine. And when you underdo twine, it's really soft. It almost feels like human hair. So I'm going to embed that twine inside this larger manila rope here. And then, wind here we're working with. Then you want to get your flint. Now some people, like I said, it's a matter of technique. Some people will put that um, flint or, or the char cloth on the ground and, and throw the sparks on it that way. I like to uh, fold it under. Do not expect this to go. I've never had it go the first time. And what we're gonna try to do is catch, catch a falling spark and put it in your char cloth. Catch a falling spark and put it. And that's what we're, oh, did you see that? But until I see it there, see it? The little red spark. See that? That will not go out, folks. Here, get down your cameras there. That will not go out unless it gets wet. Okay, and it burns very hot, okay? And so what you do then is you embed it. Now, keep in mind, we would already have our fire and our sticks ready to go, our kindling, right? You do know that. So we would have a little area for that. And there it is. Then you'd have your fire all set up, and you put that underneath the fire, and look how long that'll burn. Because you have your little twigs and everything. Of course, I didn't do that, so we were not really building a fire. And that's way better than a match. We just consider how small a flame a match is. That I've never had it fail at that point. Once you put that under some sticks, that goes right up like that. So there you go, flint and steel. Fire started. Fire! Fire in the hole! And I gotta tell you, I was, you know, in every Boy Scout troop, you know, one kid likes to go and hunt fish or, you know, and go throw rocks at rabbits. I was the pyro in ours, so uh, <laughs> it uh, made it fun to be an adult living historian doing this stuff. Boy, and that so, makes me feel like I'm cheating when I use my matches from REI that burn underwater. Ooh! Oh, <laughs> Have you tried it? Did they yes, work? Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah? Wow. Yeah, you can dunk them in water and they don't go out. Wow. That's, that's a step beyond fire or waterproof, isn't it? So um, these, I, this is what the neat thing is, to bring history to kids in schools. And we would love it if we could go to every school and show them this stuff. Because when you get fifth graders and they see that, you know, their, their little eyes open up. And all of a sudden, history goes from like, who was bored with history in school? I mean, I've never met a kid that almost it wasn't. But when you show them these kinds of things, and then you talk about really what was the motivation, not so much the date, who did what on what day. Of course, that's, but why? 
why? Why did people, it's really psychology. Why did they choose the options that they had at the time? And there's things that we're doing in our modern world that historians will tell us about decades from now. Just like we're learning more about, uh, what was the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. How many new documents have come out yeah. in the last few years telling about what we didn't all know back then? Those of us who were here. <laughs> I might not have been, but I was just born after that. So if anybody would like an additional view here or otherwise, we can probably should keep moving along here, okay? Any questions?